offered to bring Jennifer Stowe here for a tea tasting and for her program. Who would have thought we'd have this wonderful turnout and a beautiful day to go with it. <laughs> I'm site director here at Belmont Mansion. Uh, Belmont is owned by the Alabama Historical Commission and we have the honor locally of operating it for the AHC. And the group that operates it is the Colbert County Historical Landmarks Foundation. We have wonderful staff who are not in here for me to introduce you to, but you will see them. You will also see many of our volunteers helping with the serving of this tea. And perhaps I'll walk around and tell y'all more about them when the time comes. But right now, the high point of our afternoon is to introduce Jennifer Stowe and her daughter, Julia, out here, Julia Stowe, from Three Sisters Tea Room in Campbellsville, Tennessee. And we found out about them because they came to visit us a couple of years ago before the pandemic. And Stephanie, who works here, there's Stephanie, I was asking for staff. Stephanie, our site manager, met Jennifer and Julia. I think you were here too, weren't you? I was not, so I missed meeting them that day. But um, ever since, we've been talking about bringing y'all here and having a tea. So thank you so much, Jennifer and Julia, for coming today. And then, um, let's see, I do want to tell you that at Christmas time, the us, all of us here, the staff, went to Jennifer's Tea Room and enjoyed a Christmas tea. So uh, you may want to mark your calendars and do that sometime after you're introduced to them. So thank you so much, Jennifer, for being here, and I'll turn it over to you and help you in any way that we can. Okay, thank you. And that's really just what we all want to get to anyways. We've brought three very special teas with us today that we serve in the tea room. Two of them, and one of them we blended especially for Belmont's um, tea today. And that's an herbal, so we'll be doing that at the end of the presentation. But before I get started, I wanted to ask if anybody likes tea in here. Anybody drinks tea? Okay. Okay, if you could just call out some of the types of teas that you like to drink. Chamomile. Chamomile, okay. Earl Grey. Earl Grey. Sleepy time. time. Breakfast time. Okay. Well, that's great. Anybody else? Lady Grey. Lady Grey. Good. Who <laughs> Oh, so serious <laughs> tea drinker over there. Very good. Okay. All right. Well, you know, Earl Grey happens to be the most popular tea in the world. It is the most popular flavor tea in the world. And then the chamomile and the sleepy time actually aren't real tea. They're just an infused herbal beverage. And we're going to be talking strictly about tea today that comes from the Camilla sinensis plant. And they asked me to talk a little bit about tea history and a little bit about tea culture. So we have a combination to share with you today. But on your seats, you have a little journal. And uh, this is something Julie and I feel very strongly about. We uh, have many tea journals uh, that we keep. And for every tea event we ever go to, we make a little journal entry about it. And we have many tea, uh, types of journals in our tea room. So we brought you just a really simple journal today. And we gave you a pen. So you have to make some notes about your tea experience here today. The date, the weather, the time, who you were with, and what was wonderful about it. Maybe the delicious food. And if you haven't been to the other side of the house, you're in for a real treat. They have a beautiful spread they put together for you today. So also our contact information is on the back of the booklet. We would love to stay in touch with you through emails. We have a newsletter. Uh, we also um, hope have a certain uh, website and, and Facebook page that you can follow us along with. I am going to have to stand in the middle of the room, so if you can't hear me, I, I, please let me know, and I am going to have my back to some of you. But uh, we'll get started, and this is, uh, okay, so the first thing I just mentioned, this is the Camilla sinensis plant, and it grows really well in Alabama, so if any of you want to see it, and I saw it last summer at Lowe's and Home Depot, they had Camilla sinensis plants, 
they'll grow very well here. They like this climate. And it was discovered a long, long time ago by an emperor in China, Shenyang, and uh, it was first believed to be a medicinal uh, beverage because it's very bitter and um, it was fresh seed, uh, leaves right off the plant. And so it didn't have the lovely flavors that we think of today. And it's, it was uh, originally founded, of course, in China and very quickly it migrated to Japan. When the uh, monks would come to China to train, they would find the tea, help them stay awake, and they took that back with them to Japan. And eventually it made its way to India via the tea trade routes, um, arrived in the Middle East, and from the Middle East it made its way to Africa. And from Africa, it was just a short jump across the Straits of Gibraltar into Europe, into Spain. And the reason I ended with Spain is because that's a very important uh, location for one particular re reason I'll get to in a minute. Now, I will tell you that I've given entire classes on this slide, so we did it really, really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I went around the world in about 30 seconds. So, um, hmm. okay, Julia, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, Duchess of Bedford, and she was the um, 
uh, in Queen Victoria's court. She was very, she was actually related to Queen Victoria. She, they were very close. And um, Anna, like so many of us today, about mid-afternoon, got that sinking feeling, and, and she was would like a little refreshment. So she would ask for a pot of tea, which was now a very, very common beverage, but it was just a beverage, um, and some, some bread and butter, or maybe a little um, pastry that was being prepared for the evening meal. And she asked for it to be brought to her room. And it kind of revived her. She was basically very hungry come 3 o'clock in the morning. At this time, the court would have had a breakfast, and they would have had a dinner, and not a lot in between. So she gets a little mid-afternoon mid snack, and she feels really good about it. And she starts to invite some of her friends to smoke. But eating outside of mealtime was not really considered very proper in the etiquette realm. And so um, she is in her bedroom, in her bed chambers. Now, it's not like our bedroom and many rooms to this, but it's her own little private quarters. And she invites friends into this intimate space. And um, what happens is she started a craze that we still enjoy today, although we did at some point in time, come out of the bedchamber and move down into the, the living room and tea rooms in general. And so this is a picture of Victoria and Albert on the throne, and, and it was during their, um, or Queen Victoria's reign, that the British Empire grew so much and they developed a monopoly on tea by acquiring the um, East India Company and one of the imports was tea. Um, they had sent spies into China to learn how to grow tea, to extract tea samples, and tea seeds, and try to grow it um, in England, and that was a miserable success. In fact, very, very little tea is grown in England. There are some small farms, but it's not on a, on a um, commercial scale. Um, but they had the colony in India, and India's climate was very similar to areas of, in China that grew tea very well, and so they started growing tea in India, but what they found out a few years later is that India had its own indigenous tea plant, the, the, uh, different from China, and uh, that's why when you get tea from India, it's very different than tea from China. The taste and flavor is, is distinct. And what developed as a, just a mid-afternoon snack with Anna during Queen Victoria's reign developed into the afternoon tea that we know uh, from maybe the Edwardian time period, and that's what that bottom picture is showing. The height of tea gowns and tea hats and fancy tea paraphernalia um, around a low table. So, I thought it would be a really good idea. There's a lot of tea terms that get passed around, and um, we call tea a lot of different things. First of all, tea can just be the drink that you have in a tea pot. It can also be um, a meal. So, we're going to define some of these tea terms. And if you ever go to a tea room, you might see they offer a wee tea, or a royal tea, or a high tea. And you maybe don't know what it is. You're going to find out today what those words mean. Um, so, the first one we're going to talk about is the beverage, and we've already discussed this quite a bit. I have a half a dozen or so tea plants growing on our property, and, and it's very, very fun to collect the seeds. And the seeds that set for this past autumn um, will be, the flowers that set this past autumn will be my seeds next year. It's a very slow um, propagation process. Um, so that's the beverage. This is what we call a brisk tea. In this country, we might call it a coffee break. It's just a cup of tea and a cookie, or a little bite of something. Um, it's, it's just a little 15-minute pick-me-up. It's kind of like driving through the, the, the drive through at Starbucks and getting a coffee and a biscotti or something like that. That's, that's a brisk tea. And that means aptly named. It's very refreshing. This is a cream tea, and this by far, Julia and I always say this is our most favorite tea meal of all, is so um, it's just two scones, usually it's two scones with cream and jam and all the great toppings, and a pot of tea, so a little bit more substantial. And if I go to a tea room and they offer a real cream tea, I almost always get it because um, it's just so filling, so delicious, and really set apart. And if, um, I don't really need all the little finger sandwiches and everything if I've got two scones, that's going to fill me right up. So I highly recommend a cream tea if you've ever seen it on the menu. And it's named cream tea because they usually are serving you clotted cream of some kind, whether it's authentic or some kind of knockoff version. And if you uh, have ever had clotted 
clotted cream? Anybody have clotted cream or made clotted cream? It's a real treat. It's just so delicious. The next uh, term would be an afternoon tea, and that's what you're going to experience here today. An afternoon tea is what developed out of Anna's bedchamber snack. It uh, developed into three types of foods on um, three tiers. And you know, that, I just looked at that. That's a two tier tray. This is in our tea room. But um, we would normally have a three tier tray, and it would have uh, finger sandwiches or savories of some kind served on the bottom. And those are eaten, they're usually pretty bland. Um, like cucumber sandwiches or watercress sandwiches or something like that, except for uh, we tend to have very, very savory um, finger sandwiches, which kind of breaks a lot of tea rules, but um, they just taste sweet. <laughs> they taste good. So uh, that's to kind of blunt your appetite, because you don't want to just dive into all the sweets really hungry. So you, you get a little something in your tummy, and then you move on to the second tier where uh, it's going to be your scones. And we usually bring those out hot, so they're on a, they're on a plate, which is why I only have two tiers. And the scones should be served warm. They should be served with cream and jam and uh, homemade lemon curd, anything like that. And they are to be eaten, um, they're best eaten warm. And then the top tray would have your sweets on it. And that could be anything from chocolate dipped strawberries to uh, some kind of a cookie or an um, individual um, cheesecake or a little mini pie, anything like that. We do a lot of different things seasonally, depending on what we have growing in the garden. And so you want to eat from the bottom to the top. So you have your sandwiches first, your scones, and your um, desserts last. But uh, it's not like a rule or anything. You can eat it any way you want, whatever tickles your fancy. Because even though the portions are tiny, and uh, you look at that and think, that's never going to fill me up. I guarantee you, you will be full by the end of it. It's, it's quite a filling meal. And then if you wanted to have a royal tea, it's basically an afternoon tea that I've just described, and here I've got a three-tier tray in our tea room, um, with a glass of champagne added to it. And a lot of hotel lobbies, when they serve their afternoon teas, will offer a royal tea. It's very celebratory, very festive, and that actually is just some of our um, iced herbal teas, but it looked kind of like champagne, so I used that for the picture. So that's a royal tea. And the last one is the high tea. And this is probably the most confusing of all. A lot of people will think that high tea is the fanciest of all um, teas. What we know now is called afternoon tea. So sometimes you'll go into a hotel lobby and they say high tea at 4 o'clock. And it's really not a traditional high tea. High tea was the workman's or the laboring classes evening meal. It was served at a high dining table, not a low tea table or a coffee table as we might know it. Um, it always included um, a pot of strong black tea. It was, it was often served on coarser types of crockery instead of fine china with um, meat, um, eggs, cheese, lots of bread, uh, uh, grilled tomatoes, sausages, those sorts very, very different than the afternoon tea. Afternoon tea, in fact, you usually don't even get utensils on the table. Uh, you're, everything should be finger food and bite size. If you didn't have a fork for a meal like this, you'd be in trouble, wouldn't you? So high tea is, is, a, is a real hearty meal served at the higher dining table. Okay, I'm sure a lot of you have heard that tea is very healthy. And I sometimes, giggle at the next and latest thing that tea supposedly cures and, pre and prevents, but um, there are a few verified health benefits of tea. And I think everyone knows that tea contains polyphenols, green tea, especially matcha, has, has the most antioxidants of all, so uh, although all teas have some antioxidants. Um, black tea in particular helps aid in digestion. A lot of people will drink tea after a meal, which seems really nice, to, but it also physically does settle in your stomach. So there's, there's um, wisdom in that kind of finishing your meal with a cup of tea. It boosts your energy because of the caffeine, but also the theine that doesn't make you feel jittery and jumpy. Um, and, it, it, it and because of the, the symbiotic relationship between those two chemicals, um, 
it makes you alert, and but and your creativity is um, released in in a way that is uh, lovely, and that's really why the monks liked tea all those years previously. Tea may aid in weight loss. That's kind of an unsupported one, but um, especially oolong tea, they say, is really good, or in green tea for weight loss. It supports mental health. It prevents tooth decay, and I just think that's so nice. It might stay in your teeth, but um, it also, because of the um, antibacterial properties in tea, it, it, um, it helps with um, bacteria in your mouth and pre uh, prevents tooth decay. And they are doing a lot of studies right now with diabetics on blood sugar with tea, and um, it, it seems pretty interesting to me as a nurse uh, what they're discovering about blood, uh, tea with sugar, blood sugar, cholesterol, and heart disease. So those are some great benefits of tea. Julia, how are we doing with the tea, honey? Okay. All right, so we're going to have tea together, so we better know about tea etiquette. And uh, we do an awful lot of in-depth etiquette classes, but this is just kind of like the highlights. <laughs> and I always tell, I do, I do a lot with little girls in etiquette, and I always tell them that etiquette and manners has got nothing to do with you showing off what you know about manners at a tea table. It's got everything to do about blessing the people that you're seated at the table with. Uh, you want to just uh, be polite so that you're a pleasant table mate. And the first thing that uh, we always have to deal with, and it's kind of awkward, is what to do with the napkin. And you want to put the napkin on your back. And I'm going to take by this napkin right here. And even with napkins, there's actually a little way to put napkins on your lap. And I did find this out at my um, sister-in-law's wedding. I was, I was expecting uh, my ch a child any, any day, and I was uh, enjoying some chocolate chip strawberries. And I think, do you have chocolate chip strawberries? Over there, I, so I thought I saw, uh, and uh, I had it in my hand, and it was all over my fingertips, and I had on a very pale pink dress, and I wiped my fingers on the napkin, and when I stood up, there was chocolate all over my dress. But if you put your napkin on top, it won't happen. You take the fold, and you put it towards your waist, and then when you have your chocolate fingertips, you just lift the top layer and, and wipe and then when you put your layer down, you've protected your pale pink dress. <laughs> so, um, and when you're drinking your tea, uh, a lot of people want to put their pinky up, and I have a lot of little girls in the tea room, and they think that that makes them look a little bit more grown up. And there was a reason that people lifted their pinky, but it's not, it's really considered affectatious today and kind of uh, not good manners. The reason that we needed to lift the pinky is when China cups first came to England, they were from China, and they were bowls. They didn't have handles. So if you ever try to take a hold of a, a, the rim of, I should have brought a tea bowl, um, to hold it up, to counter the weight, you stick your finger out. But we don't need to do it with you, we've got hands, so we're good. Um, I have this happen an awful lot. People want to put cream and lemon in their tea. And it's an interesting science experiment. I don't recommend it. It kind of looks like cottage cheese at the end. So just choose one. And I see you've got lemon, and I don't see that you have cream. And sometimes it, uh, tea rooms won't offer you milk um, if they are setting tea, um, if they're setting lemon now, just so you don't make that mistake. Um, in England, there's a raging debate. Oh, let me do uh, scone or scone. You may have heard I say scone. It's just a regional dialect thing. In, in, in uh, north of England and Scotland, they'll say scone. Uh, other places say scone. And then pretty much in this country, we say scone. Uh, but I grew up in New England, and we said scone. So <laughs> that's why I still say it. Um, and milk or tea first. This is a raging debate in England. Um, years and years ago, before uh, bone china was um, very fragile and delicate and couldn't withstand the heat of boiling water poured directly, or the hot tea poured directly into the teacup, so they would add a little milk to kind of temper the cup and then to be able to tolerate the hot tea without cracking the cup. Um, it's not necessary today. In fact, I don't even understand how you could know how much milk to add if you didn't have the tea in there first. So, uh, but there's, there's really divided camps, and people get very, um, uh, you know, they, they really feel that their way is the best way. So uh, when you are drinking your tea cup, uh, out of your tea cup, um, you always want to 
hold your teacup close to your saucer, and when you take a sip, you want to look into your teacup, not over your teacup. To look over the cup is considered very flirtatious, and, um, <laughs> and, and um, so you want to look into your teacup. And, uh, you know, I have, ever since I, I learned that little tip, I have tried to observe photographs of maybe the royal family that I might see in different places to see what they do, because they're always pictured drinking tea, or often, if they're out at functions. And especially the, the young um, royals, um, what's her name? Kate, uh, Princess Kate. She's very, she always looks into her teacup. It's very, very sweet to see that. Uh, she doesn't want to look flirtatious. <laughs> but it's just a neat little uh, tip. And then even uh, so far as how to stir your tea, if you put milk or sugar in it, you never want to, um, you know, make a whirlpool in your teacup or anything. Uh, you want to kind of go like north south, north south, without or six twelve, you know, without clinking the sides of your cups. So those are just a few little tips to make you a wonderful table mate at today's tea. <laughs> um, do you have scones today? No, we don't have a kitchen. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, when you have scones in a tea room, or when you make them yourself. Um, and you know, really, we're all Southerners here, or at least I'm a transplant Southerner. Um, scones are really just biscuits that have reached their full potential. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I never enjoyed a biscuit as much as I enjoy my scones. So, but there is a proper way to eat them, and a lot of folks um, they do a lot of different things. But I'll just show you the, the standard way. Again, this is finger food, so we want to break it apart with our fingers. And a properly made scum will have kind of like a natural divide. It will rise and have a natural kind of split in the center, just like a good biscuit. So you break it apart, and then you want to break off a little bite-sized piece, and you can put on your chopping, whatever it might be, your, your, um, your cream, your clotted cream, or your jam, or your curds, and then eat, uh, spread that on your little bite-sized piece and eat that. Um, you know, just like the milk first or tea first debate, there is a, a, a huge continental divide, of, or uh, island divide in England about whether to put jam on your scum first or your clotted cream on first. And just, you do whatever you want, okay? <laughs> all right. But um, you don't want to ever split it in half and then slather up both sides of your scum with toppings and then kind of put it back together and eat it like a, like a hamburger or a sandwich or something like that. That's, um, it's not a way to enjoy a scum, first of all, and it's just not kind of really polite either. Um, the other idea that I often see, especially little kids, because they don't really know what to do with the scum, is they'll spread it all over the top, and they don't even break it all apart, and then they just eat it like a donut, you know, really cool. so they're missing out on a lot of things, but um, there you have that. We're ready, right? Okay. Um, so a lot of people want to know about a proper table setting, and we're almost done, okay, so I know you're all getting hot. Um, and so this is a very formal uh, table setting, and um, this would not be for tea, but maybe for a more uh, formal meal. But there's always this tricky thing, people always want to know where to put the cell phone. So. <laughs> should be on your tea table, or, or on your table when you're eating at all. Um, that includes glasses, and I'm kind of attached to my glasses, and that's very hard for me. They should go on your lap if you need them frequently, or stowed under your chair, like your purse and your um, phone and everything should be stored under your chair. So anyways, that's just, just a little bit of a joke. And so now we're going to move into the tea tasting, and this is going to be very, very tricky because it's a big group, but Julie is going to try to come through. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the first tea that we're tasting. And if you all just kind of want to wait until we get our tea and taste it together. The, um, Julie, this is the Belmont blend, correct? Yes. Okay. The first one we're going to be tasting is the Belmont blend. And this is an herbal blend, and it's all organic. Uh, we're getting chamomile, spearmint, and rose petal. And these are three herbs that you could grow here in your garden very easily, and they're simple. And they taste delicious. This is a caffeine-free version, of course. There's no, no caffeine in any of these. And there are huge health benefits in 
cat mild, and in the spearmint. Rose does have some health properties, but it also just has a little bit of flavor. And so before you taste your tea, you want to smell it, you want to notice the color, 